Thank you. And we've got who's coming back? Haley. Here we go. On the side. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I certainly enjoyed that panel, and I hope everybody in the room did as well. Um, no brainer. That's all I can say. No brainer. So next up, we have a presentation um, from the country, um, and they're going to talk to us about the challenge of infrastructure sustainability in a local government and in a regional context. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce Julian Fife and Brad Gauchi, who's coming to talk to us about parks. Thank you. Thanks, Hayley. Um, just set my timer. I'm get, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting a bit tired, so if I see you nodding off, I'm not going to get too offended. <laughs> uh, so, yes, we're from the country. Um, <laughs> we're actually... Brad's not from the country, but he's certainly living with us in Parks, New South Wales, if you're not familiar. Um, it's in, yeah, west, central west of New South Wales. So Brad is the commissioning engineer um, with John Holland, who's the principal head contractor for our water and sewage treatment plant upgrades. And I'm Julian Fife, the infrastructure technical manager with Parkshire Council. And I'm working on the team, obviously, managing those uh, projects. So this presentation is really a little bit of a case study, I suppose, about a small regional organisation grappling with what seems to me to be quite a metropolitan-driven um, evolution in infrastructure delivery. Um, it is quite a challenge for us with a relatively small organisation and, and limited resources to undertake, you know, getting an ISCA rating, but we're, we're working hard and we're, hopefully we'll get there. Um, test if this works. Okay. So, as I said, Parks is in the central west of New South Wales. We're surrounded by towns like Dubbo and Forbes, who, as you may know from the news, recently got flooded um, with the heavy rains over the winter season, and Orange. And Parks is probably most famous for the dish, which is of uh, the CSIRO tele radio telescope to the north, which was the film the dish was based on. Um, so what's happening in Parks at the moment is a once-in-a-generation renewal of the water infrastructure. And I'm not just... This is about the water and sewage treatment plants, but there's various other items of infrastructure being upgraded at the same time, all to basically bring us up to the new age. And um, with a heavy focus, obviously, because small towns have this kind of renewal so infrequently, there's a heavy focus on getting it right and future-proofing it. And... Also supporting economic development in the region, or well, locally and in the broader region, and obviously increasing levels of service generally, in line in particular with DPI Water, the Department of Primary Industries state government organisation who regulates uh, local water youth utilities in New South Wales. So if, if we look at parks itself, um, we've got... The two plants, um, unfortunately, the <laughs> it's slightly offset. So we've got a water treatment plant to the north west of the northeast of the town, and to the southeast, just off, right at the bottom. It's slightly off that map, unfortunately. But we've got a new sewage treatment plant coming in. So the water treatment plant is located at a new greenfield site, whereas the sewage treatment plant is it's very located very close to the existing plant, but it is again a greenfield site as well. So I'll just um, run through the process a little bit. So with a new water treatment plant, it's basically a dissolved air flotation followed by filtration. Then we chlorinate, fluoridate and store the water in the lagoons there, uh, in the tank, sorry. Uh, one of the good things with the process is we recover all the backwash waste and the, the float as well. So we don't actually discharge any water from this plant. We just recover it, send it all back to the header works. And the other thing um, for council in looking at future-proofing the town with their water supply is it can actually take water from three different sources or a blend of... So it can take either dam water, river water or the bore field water as well. 
and the, it's designed in such a way it can be operated to treat all of them and improve the water quality the town currently has. And with the sewage stream plant, it's a similar kind of concept. The new plant will be a lot better than the current plant that's installed. It's also able to be upgraded, so as the town grows, you just need to add a new tank to it. The process, uh, as it is installed, or will be installed, is an uh, intermittent aeration and extended um, decant tank. Uh, then it's followed by clarify to remove any remaining solids, and followed finally by a UV plant before it gets discharged to the creek. Uh, one of the good things we've got designed into it is we don't need to pump once we got to the inlet works. We follow gravity through the whole plant. Uh, there's also works well advanced to install a recycling plant right next door to the site. So we'll be able to use that water around town in parks and golf course and those kinds of facilities. Okay, so um, Parks has been dreaming about this infrastructure for a long time, probably since before 1991 really, but um, it's, it's been formalised through the integrated water cycle management process, uh, strategy and process which heavily focuses on community health and amenity, levels of service, water security, water quality, all of which feed nicely into ISCA and sustainability more broadly. Um, but Council, in the, in the early stages of the planning, were quite aware of trying to promote sustainability through this infrastructure, and so there was a number of discussion papers generated that informed the design development of the projects. Um, but as far as ISCA, the rating coming into the whole project, it was a, it's a little bit fraught, I sh if, if, uh, for want of a better term, maybe. But um, So while sustainability was front and centre in, in a sense of the planning phases, getting a rating or a certification kind of sat there in the ether for a while. So council initiated what we think is quite an innovative procurement process called selective tender, tender involvement. We had tenderers coming in and workshopping the designs ver from very early on. Um, and during that process, John Holland, the ultimate winner of the tender, was raised the prospect of an ISCA rating. Um, but somehow still the um, rating didn't get incorporated into the contract that was um, handed to John Holland. So essentially after that extensive procurement process, the contract was awarded and then we had to go through the process then of putting up a deed of amendment, making the business case and putting up a deed of amendment so that we could get in, um, an ISCA rating as part of the project. Um, really, it's, essentially, it's a kind of a in good faith agreement between John Holland and Parkshire Council to collaborate to achieve uh, an ISCA rating based on a series of targets that we've identified. And so... As the project is executed, John Holland will go through, identify opportunities in addition to what are already kind of built into the project design, take them to council and then council will assess it as a variation or otherwise and then we move forward with that. So we've, to date it's been a fairly productive um, relationship but at the same time because it came, the agreement to do this came after the fact we are working a little bit behind the eight ball in a... <laughs> Um, ongoing basis. Um, but to date, in terms of progress, we do have commitment to sustainability in the rating. We've got some, the, right, some, uh, the management structures in place, and we've got documentation, we've got a business case for the sustainability, we've got a policy now agreed to by both parties and a management plan. We've held critical workshops and meetings and We've also got a register going, obviously, of sustainability measures that are, in a, again, in addition to what we'd already established. Yeah, so pretty much um, it goes along with what Julian was saying. We had, the, we had our kick-off meeting at the start. We established all of our management plans. Um, we've decided upon a base case, but we haven't got that verified yet. That's in the works. And we've done a preliminary weightings assessment as well, which has had a beneficial impact for the regional area. It, it, it is significantly better than version 1.1, we've noticed. Uh, and we're 
we just need to finalise that assessment now. Uh, once we do all of that, obviously we'll have to go through the process of self-assessment and then review it and do the final submission to ISCA. Okay, and that's where um, project governance is critical, obviously. And in this sense, um, we've got two parties involved, but from the outset, Council had this set of golden rules, which do encompass a lot of sustainability principles. I won't dwell on them too much, but that kind of set this, the groundwork for the major projects, including other infrastructure projects that Council are embarking on at the moment. But that's, they were kind of the kind of non-negotiables as far as council was concerned in, in um, awarding and, and then managing contracts. But then obviously we're working with John Holland in particular on these projects and so a project charter was established, not necessarily with sustainability in mind for doing this, this was about setting the ground rules for the project and as you can see there's some things just about delivery and making decisions that are best for project, not you know, time or, or cost oriented. Um, but one of the key items in there is sustainability outcomes as well. So that's an overarching document between the two organisations. And then we obviously developed a sustainability policy that was a bit more specific and, and therefore pointing towards our risk rating as well. Yep, so as part of um, the development of the policy, we also developed a sustainability management plan, which embedded a lot of the targets we want to achieve. Some of these are in the, the contract, just purely through the funding arrangements set up for the project. Others are so we can achieve our escalade and that we want to do. Uh, we've got in there, we include local participation, um, reducing waste, um, offsetting, uh, diverting from landfill, all of those kind of targets you'd expect to see in there. And for this project, we are aiming to, get, aiming to get an excellent rating here and we'll see how far we can actually achieve with it. Yeah. A, a very optimistic assessment um, gave us potentially leading, but <laughs> Probably a bit too much. we're tracking. We may not track that, that well, um, but we'll see. Stay optimistic, hey? Um, now, critical, obviously, to getting a rating, though, is having a management structure that works, and in this case, a very collaborative one. Um, and, and as I say, it's two layered because of the two organisations. So at the heart, obviously, sits council, but council's beholden to its community, and that's, you know, pretty much all our drivers are informed by, um, by community consultation, and also we have complaints processes, as any council does. Um, so there's a very strong two-way um, exchange of ideas, information and everything with the community. We've got our key stakeholders, particularly New South Wales Government, the council liaises with more directly, although John Holland have, some, have had some role in the Section 60 approvals for the, for the works. Um, and then, obviously, there's, a very, there's various lines of communication between John Holland and the council. And then within John Holland, they've got their own structures as you'd expect a tier one um, company to have. And then council is the one that's actually applying for the rating, is registered with ISCA and put in the application. Um, but that's not to say that there is an interaction. There probably should be also an arrow between John Holland and, and ISCA as well there. Yep, so with, um, with the structure, we've got our, we're certified for the quality system. Uh, environment system and safety system and we also have uh, set up an internal system for sustainability as well. We have our internal reporting which goes a long way to actually gaining a lot of the evidence that we need to report for the Cisco rating. Yep and um, but um, the trick is that this, the structures that we have don't necessarily align neatly with the management credits in ISCA so um, we've got sustainability reporting coming from John Holland to Council, but then Council being the applicant to ISCA, how, you know, we've, we've got to make the case that that reporting is reflective of um, the re relevant credit. Um, but what we're looking to, and more broadly on sustainability reporting on an annual level, might be through Council itself. Um, and again, major project decisions 
there's two layers to all decisions that are being made, and sometimes that, that some of those decisions have involved both council and John Holland, and some involve just the council, and some obviously just John Holland. Um, again, and another complexity is with procurement because of the two layer, the two parties involved. Um, is obviously the procurement of the, the contract for the um, infrastructure build itself, which council managed. And that came about through an extensive, first, the process was defined through an extensive deliberation about the best model for council to get the outcomes that council was after, both um, in terms of the infrastructure durability and future proofing uh, objectives and water security and everything else, but also sustainability. Um, so we had this early selected tender involvement process um, and then through in the contract we, we then inserted a whole series of requirements that feed into the ISCA rating but again don't necessarily align perfectly with what the, the rating dictates or, or looks asks for. Um, but, and also another trick is the council is beholden or must, is governed by the Local Government Act procurement rules um, but we certainly have yeah, sought to put um, procurement uh, goals like local participation, economic stimulus, indigenous employment into the contract and for John Holland's procurement purposes. Yeah, um, with some of that, we actually have a local procurement target we need to meet. It's about 35% of the contract sum. Uh, to help achieve this with council, we hosted local business sessions, which were quite good, but one of the feedback that we got from some of the local suppliers is you have to go with us, therefore we can charge you whatever you want. Uh, this is one of the reasons why you need to make sure that there's competition in the market so you don't actually end up with that kind of situation. Uh, and also we do have to increase the skill of the local workforce and training KPIs are actually part of our contract as well. Next one, please. So one of the other hurdles we've had in the region is a lot of the mum and dad businesses around don't have the documentation that's actually required to track waste, track recycling, although a lot of them have been doing it. One of the local earth moving subcontractors we have takes away the concrete, crushes it, reuses it. Uh, even the, our concrete supplier will take back the concrete that waste concrete from a pour and make some concrete blocks and reuse it as well, basically minimising the waste there. But we need that documentation to back up to prove that it's actually happening. One thing we did also learn when we approached these suppliers about the supply chain sustainability school, most of them were quite keen to learn more about it, uh, as they, they're all aware that this is the future and this is the way the market will be going. Um, look, I think um, just being mindful of time limits, um, we were going to talk about some of the performance, but I, I probably skipped through this a little bit, but... Um, Climate change is a critical one for us. Even though the region is aware of it and will feel the impacts of climate change quite acutely, um, it's, there's a little bit of ambivalence about climate change. And so while we've got an assessment that applies to the council more broadly and, and has elements that look at infrastructure, we don't have an assessment of the infrastructure itself. And getting that up and running is probably going to prove to be a bit problematic. Um, but... Other things we're doing well on are like the renewable energy. Both plants are going to have significant solar arrays associated with them. And there's a strong community appetite for that kind of thing. So there's no pushback in why you're spending money on this kind of stuff. Um, and then I, I just think I'll just quickly show we are, you know, we want to share lessons learned. And one, one we're struggling, have been struggling with is we've had the wettest season in recorded history. And so our stormwater management has been, and erosion and seed controls have been overwhelmed, but also, like, probably we've recognised that they, they were a bit short at times. And so that's one of the key areas where we recognise we may not, or we're hoping we can, we've, we've come up with some strategies to help us perform better and get the environmental outcomes, but whether it actually adheres to the ISCA requirements remains to be seen. Yeah, following up with that... Um We've got land use. These sites, as they're greenfield um, plants, we do not score very well with um, the rating system. But you have to consider that no one wants to live next to an STP, so where we're building it, there's an obvious reason for that. 
Uh, obviously, we make up points in stakeholder engagement and those kind of categories, which is quite good. And the other thing, with the regional area, while we're segregating waste, we're doing everything we can, it is actually quite hard to find recyclers in the local area. They'll have to ship it all the way to Sydney, which defeats the purpose in recycling if you're going to have to ship it that far. Uh, the other thing is the attitude of some of the workforce. They don't see the need to recycle, so you have to keep reinforcing the point over and over and over again to them just to make sure they separate the waste correctly. Yeah, again, and upskilling the local workforce is really a big part of one of the challenges we face. Just quickly, on stakeholder engagement, we feel we'll do well because that's Council's bread and butter. Um, college in Heritage, um, we've got some opportunities there and we, we did well in the planning stages again on that front. But on the urban design credit, that's where we might struggle. And again, this is where the metropolitan focus might weigh against our particular context. But um, just to close, because I see Haley's looking to get us uh, moving on. Um, there's certainly, we, as we can see it anyway, a, an economy of scale associated with pursuing an ISCA rating. And as a small organisation working with a tier one contractor who's actually much, 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 much bigger than we are in economic terms, um, this is certainly <coughs> a challenge. And buy-in is critical, obviously, to getting a rating, but it's cha it is challenging when, um, A, sustainability and ISCA aren't necessarily embedded in the contractual KPIs, and also when your contractors and your subcontractors and suppliers are new to sustainability, and that's particularly with the local um, suppliers and contractors. Um, auditing has helped us identify the gaps where we're falling short, but it's difficult to act sometimes because of the limited resources we have, but we're trying our best. Um, the project planning base of the project is quite strong and we think we can help, that helps us with our performance to start with and, and our performance on going through the construction is improving. And, but the mountain of evidence remains looming large in our horizon but we do think the excellent rating is still in our sights. So yeah, we'll leave it there. They're the sights.